then the state collapses. So what was it beforehand, when you, you get the measurement and find out what the result is, but was, was it before uh, something real? A good question. Could you explain uh, what the relevance of trading as cat is to this problem? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a very good question because uh, uh, the quantum states are, are only come into play, really, when you look at things at the microscopic level. And if you look at things at the macroscopic level, which our astronomers do, then uh, they're pretty much determinist. Uh, we don't see uh, uh, a moon suddenly going out of its orbit and <laughs> uh, unless there's some, uh, something there to perturb the orbit. Uh, and at, at our level, uh, at the level of human beings, which is halfway between the, the microscopic quantum states and the macroscopic uh, states of the universe and stars and planets, uh, we're in between. And this thing of Schrodinger's cat is somehow looking at this intermediate stage between the microscopic and the macroscopic. So uh, I guess we get back again to the question, is the quantum state real? You have this quantum state, which is a superposition of the live cat and the dead cat with one half probability each. <laughs> so is that real? I'll leave it to you to answer. <laughs> so here's the fourth session, Tuesday morning before lunch. How do the major religions or traditions of belief have a dialogue with science? This was very interesting. Is dialogue with science equally important to all the major world religions and traditions of belief? There are such great differences. I should say we had, for example, besides Christians from a variety of different denominations, we had Jews uh, with varying degrees of, uh, what should I say, orthodoxy. Uh, we had uh, a number of Muslims one who was an imam in uh, Pakistan, in a rather conservative part of Pakistan, others who were professors of philosophy outside the Muslim countries, two of them. Uh, we had uh, uh, people from, from the East, uh, Buddhist, uh, Hindu, uh, Hindu atheist, physicist. Uh, I thought that was rather interesting. Um, we had uh, a, a Jainist, I think that's the right way to say it, the Jain religion from India. I don't know very much about that, uh, except that uh, the position of, uh, that it's not really important whether God exists, it's the important thing is that religion makes an, a difference in the way you live your life. Um, uh, there were some rather liberal Christians like a Quaker, and so it was an enormous variety of different religious positions. And so that makes this question uh, one that depends on the religious traditions. Why do some religions or traditions invest in the dialogue more than others? Why do others reject it? How might different religions or traditions of belief benefit from dialogue with science? We've <coughs> already said something about that, the, the, the results of science pros philosophical and theological problems. And what presuppositions does this question make about the nature of truth? These are marvelous questions, but when you have a group of 40 people from different traditions and different areas, you can imagine, uh, they used to say that if France had uh, 50 million people on any topic, there'd be 50 million and one <laughs> opinions. <Yeah>. Well, <laughs> very much the case. So there was a discussion about creation that came up at this time. Uh, someone observed that modern science began in the European Judeo-Christian tradition. And the dialogue that we're seeking in this conference is a continuation. CERN on the scientific side and, and religions on the other side. Then one of the Muslims said that Islam teaches one praise to the all-merciful and has a dialogue with science, uh, uh, appreciates science quite a lot. 
let me just make a little parenthesis that wasn't at this conference, but years ago I was at the uh, International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, which was founded by the Nobel Prize winning physicist Abdus Salam. There was a mass conference that I participated in there. And uh, uh, I had a nice chance to talk with him for about an hour when he found out that I was a priest. Uh, he was very interested because he was a very, uh, a very pious Muslim. And he told me that he had been trying for years to get the, uh, the religious leaders in Islam to recognize the importance of the scientific tradition and the value that the Al-Quran gives to uh, the beauty of nature, us studying nature. And he hadn't been successful. But Islam is certainly open to a dialogue with science. Then there came up the question of what is time? Someone mentioned St. Augustine who said something like, uh, if someone asked me what time is, I'd say I know, of course, but if he asked me to explain it, then I can't really do it. So what is time? Then also the question of uh, creation. Uh, creation, a belief in creation doesn't mean it had to begin at a certain number of billions of years ago, but uh, there's, it's quite possible to say that God is a creator from all time all past time with no beginning. Then uh, one member uh, gave the opinion that in Buddhism one should not ask these questions. I think he was not a Buddhist. Uh, he wasn't from uh, the East. There were others who said that those questions shouldn't be asked or were not important. But I think they have a relevance to the search for common truth. So the next session was interesting. Uh, after this preparation, we were going to break down into five groups. There were about 40, so each group had about eight. The heart of the question, what areas might religion and science further dialogue? So there were five discussion papers prepared, and each was supported by an introductory presentation to inform the debate. And we were all together listening to these introductory presentations. And then there were a few moments uh, to try to clarify what the speakers had said. But then we all broke down into different groups. So the sixth session was in five separate groups, each group dealing with its topic. And the seventh session was feedback from the groups. So I'm going to reorganize it, in a, not in a chronological order, but look at the groups, the different areas of what the groups were asking and what they were, the conclusions were. So uh, the first working group, the heart of the question is in what areas might religion and science further dialogue? I must say that uh, I think that some of these groups managed to be quite uh, articulate and to come to some common ground but others just uh, uh, sort of made a list of what the different members had said. So in what areas can there be dialogue? Um, well, <clears throat> uh, I think we've already mentioned ethics and uh, uh, the question of, of what kind of truth uh, can religion use to illuminate science or science use to illuminate religious beliefs. Uh, and these, uh, excuse me, I, I should have gotten, I should have uh, gone ahead a bit because after these groups there was a report that was made by them. So here's the next thing. Group one Truth, discovery, and revelation. What's the relationship between faith and experience? Experiment, observation, reason. We have all these different dimensions uh, in, in discovery and revelation. Faith, experience, experiments, observation, and reason. These are effective and uh, operative 
in religion, in theology, as well as in science. I mentioned the faith of scientists that the universe is uh, rationally uh, comprehensible and uh, in, in our cr Christian faith and in other uh, faiths that are in the Abrahamic tradition, uh, experience is important. Not exactly experiment, but the results of our experience which we observe and then reasoning on them. That was the first group. The second group had an interesting question. How are authoritative decisions made about truth? <coughs> Or is everything arbitrary? Well, it happened that I was in this group and we got off on a tangent because of the word authoritative. And uh, the question came up, uh, uh, when, someone, when you have an authority that says, uh, a religious authority, for example, that says this is a dogma you have to believe. Uh, but that's, that was not the basic point of this. The basic point of this is how do you get access to truth in a way you can really trust and believe. So the group, our group uh, was one of the groups that really didn't uh, succeed in making a good presentation. Group three, how do we experience revolutions in discovery and thought? What's the ba best way to manage periods of flux within shared truth paradigms? Well, here, there was an implicit reference to uh, Thomas Kuhn and uh, the structure of scientific revolutions, that you have a paradigm that uh, then evidence begins to accumulate and you have to change it. But uh, there were also criticisms of Kuhn's uh, uh, approach. It was clear that Kuhn had uh, a lot of, uh, of insight, but it was not just what he said. That was... Uh, more or less the position here. Um, and there were a number of other uh, cases mentioned here. The famous einstein podolsky rosen question, EPR, about uh, entanglement. Uh, einstein and his two collaborators uh, gave this example of uh, creating uh, two particles that are created uh, uh, out of nothing. So if one has spin plus one, the other has spin negative one, and they go off maybe a few light years apart, and then you measure the spin of one of them, well, the <laughs> spin was not determined, but then at that moment the other one has the opposite spin. Uh, this was so anti-intuitive that for Einstein it was a, uh, a very effective way of disproving quantum mechanics. And apparently Bohr stayed up all night <laughs> and in the morning came back to Einstein with a, a response about this. But then uh, in, uh, I think in the 1990s, Alain Aspect in, near Paris, the University of Paris, uh, ran an experiment and showed that this is actually an experimental fact and now it's been uh, proved uh, repeatedly. So here's an example of something that goes beyond what was believed, what was the theory, and then finally uh, a method comes up that will incorporate it into the way of, of looking at science and scientific knowledge. So the fourth group, what are the boundaries of knowledge and or faith? What might determine their limits? Are they self-limiting by definition? These are good questions, but I don't think there was a very much convergence. I don't recall exactly how this, uh, how they responded in this part here. Um, there certainly are limits but whether the limits are self-limits or the limits imposed from outside is another question that uh, there was not a consensus about that. Going a bit farther. The fifth 
uh, group was rather interesting. Why is CERN reflecting on this issue? Why is it participating in this dialogue? What are the challenges or risks for a scientific establishment that does not reflect on the philosophical or theological implications of its work? We had there uh, the director of CERN, uh, Rolf Hoyer, came at the beginning and at the end, and uh, Emmanuel Celis, a, a Greek physicist who's one of the directors, uh, participated in the whole session. He gave us a long talk about this. And some of the things that he said, hmm, well, sorry again, dialogue is a tool for construction, evaluation, and correction. So, uh, in dialogue, we are, we have to question what we have been doing, what our positions are, evaluate them and possibly correct them. So, CERN is a space for dialogue. People from different countries and cultures bring their ideas and proposals and have them considered by others. I recall, this is a, another personal parenthesis, when the boson, the Higgs boson was discovered, uh, one of the professors of physics at my university, the Catholic University in Rio de Janeiro, who works with CERN, gave us a couple of lectures, a group of Catholic professors that meets every week, she gave us a, a couple of lectures about the significance of the boson, the Higgs boson, how it was discovered and, and how it is responsible for particles, other particles having mass. Uh, so she's one of the people there. Another professor from our university also works at CERN. <coughs> we had a visit to the, uh, the ball at CERN. They have a, a place for our visitors that is an enormous sphere that you go into and inside there are various exhibits uh, about how the work at CERN goes on. And there are basically four experiments that they are working on uh, using the same accelerator which has a circumference of 27 kilometers. Uh, the uh, protons go back and forth between, uh, between Switzerland and France, they don't get a passport. <laughs> and they have two different, uh, two different <laughs> beams going in opposite directions. The magnets are done in such a way. Uh, so uh, they were telling us about these various, these four experiments. <coughs> two of them, the major experiments, each have 3,000 physicists working on them. And the other two experiments, the smaller ones, only have 500 each. So <laughs> about 7,000 physicists that are constantly working with CERN. At present, after this uh, great uh, uh, success of finding the Higgs boson, they've closed down the accelerator. They're retooling it to double the energy. At present, uh, but in the last things they were running, they got the uh, uh, they got the protons accelerated to 3.5 giga electron volts. What is that, a billion electron volts? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so when you have two beams coming together, that's 3 plus 5 plus 3 plus 5, that's 7 giga electron volts. But now they're retooling it, so they'll get the double of that, get 14, and see what, what happens with that. Fascinating to have that visit. But this is why they were able to detect the boson, the Higgs boson? Well, they had this level of energy that was necessary because uh, the Higgs boson would occur with a certain degree of frequency, but it needs a, a very high energy. Yeah. And they had to have enough events to be able to say that the explanation with 99 point whatever it is prob percent probability was that they had actually found the Higgs boson. There'd be other explanations possible for each of these events. And another thing about the dialogue, scientists agree on the procedure to accept or discard different ideas. A little bit more about CERN. Oh no, uh, I just wanted to say a couple of other things. Uh, I think CERN is concerned 
about the ethical implications of their work. Um, so that's one of the reasons that they're one of the reasons that they're involved in this dialogue. And uh, what is the basis for such ethical questions? Well, religion is uh, the traditional basis for ethical values. Another reason I think is that uh, uh, they depend, for, and this is a more pragmatic reason, they depend for their future on financing at a very high level. So they have to have public feeling that they are doing something of value that's worthwhile. Uh, and um, there was also the problem that some people thought when they got up to this level of, uh, of energy, they might create a black hole that would <laughs> engulf the whole Earth. <laughs> so, uh, it would start small. It what? It would start small. Yes. Start yes. So uh, those are some of the reasons for this. Uh, for the chance they to be involved. But I think the question of seeking dialogue, which is so important in scientific work as well, is fundamental here. Well, I'm almost finished. I had a couple of conclusions um, about uh, uh, myself about this. There were so many different opinions that I don't think we could really say we got to any definite conclusion. There was an interest in the search for truth and a recognition that that exists at both levels, both in religion and theology and in science. But some people, I think most of the people there did not have this position, but there's a kind of instrumentalist philosophy of science. That is, that science is only useful because it enables us to control the environment, to make new inventions and uh, uh, new technology. So it's just the advantages. It's not important uh, that it gives. It doesn't mean that it gives us some kind of access to uh, an understanding or a truth of of the environment, of the nature. And that that, uh, that was mentioned a number of times. This attitude, but no one at the conference supported it. On the other hand, uh, there was this divergence in the religious traditions between belief in the creator God or religion as a, as a kind of set of moral principles which you should try to live. And uh, that was one of these contradictions, one of these oppositions, that there was dialogue trying to understand the other side, but there was certainly no convergence on that position. Uh, this is still my conclusion. Uh, in the search for truth, the belief in a God who created an ordered universe that can be rationally investigated and understood offers a basis for a dialogue with empirical science. Uh, the idea that's been mentioned by that was mentioned by Kuru and uh, by others. That, I mean, it's a very traditional idea. Uh, Galileo also used it that God wrote two books: the Book of Nature and the Book of the Bible, and uh, they agree. Uh, and so there is a basis for dialogue. So truth has a common origin in the two books, and these two fields of experience and understanding can illuminate each other. It seems to me that uh, that, that was, in some sense, this last thing, that truth has a common origin and the two fields of experience and understanding can illuminate each other, was the basic intuition that led to this conference. So that's what I wanted to say to you. Thank you for your attention.